Okay, guys, we're here today with John Danaher. Huge honor for me, Placido. Guys, today John is gonna show us here takedowns made easy for no gi, which is pretty much like the second part of the standing to ground instruction that you're teaching, right, John? Which yes. is like the positional dominance. That's so, can you explain a little more, yeah, John? Yeah, I should start off with a proviso. Um, when we say takedowns made easy, it's always takedowns made easier. How easy or difficult a takedown is, is always contingent upon how good your opponent is. You can have a, a very solid takedown if your opponent's very, very talented, it's never gonna be easy. Um, uh, so let's start off with that understanding. The basic theme behind this, this is the second video of the Standing to Ground series. This is concerned with no gi takedowns. The idea behind the first video was that we worked from neutral positions. So plus, you don't find boring. In the first video, we looked at the idea of taking people down from neutral positions like so. Okay, we're both standing in front of each other uh, from situations where I'm either not, none of us has a grip, okay, we have no grip on each other, or even if we do have a grip, it's you can have some degree of dominance based upon your grip, but it's never gonna be strong dominance, okay? There's still good counters my opponent can do here regardless of the grip that I have on them. Working from neutral position, is the, by far the most common standing position where most of the takedowns occur because you spend most of your time in this position. Think about it. The start of a match, separate. When a match begins, the two athletes come out and you know the, the majority of, the, of their work is spent in this neutral position working like so, okay? Um, just because it's the most common position doesn't mean it's the most desirable position. As much as possible, if we're going to make it easier to take someone down and score points under the, the rule set of Jiu-Jitsu, we want to work from positions of advantage. Here, I have no intrinsic advantage over my opponent. There's good things you can do, there's good things I can do. Things get so much easier when you work from positions of dominance, such as a standing rear body lock, and like so. Okay, from here, the takedowns come easy. Okay, if my opponent's very, very talented, he can still make it tough for you, believe me but it's a hell of a lot easier to take someone down from positions like this than it is from neutral positions like so, okay? So in the second video, we focus a lot on how to get to the dominant positions of, of, of uh, standing jiu-jitsu. Now this is dear to the heart of most jiu-jitsu players, Bernardo, because from the first day we learned jiu-jitsu, we got taught the idea of position before submission. We're trying to extend the idea of position before takedown, okay? Instead of just shooting from neutral positions, from from here, it's, it's, it's hard and difficult work. You go into your opponent's hips, you go into his hands, his head position blocks you, he's got all kinds of submission holes from here. If we work from here, there's no sprawl that you have to deal with, there's very few submissions from here, they, they're fairly low percentage, and it's just in general much, much easier to control and take people down from positions like this than it is from here. Another position we investigate is short offense, where we work from a situation where you have your chest on your training partner's back. And from here, we find that the takedowns and the scoring of takedowns is so much easier from positions like this than it is from neutral position. So we spend a lot of time focusing on standing rear body lock and the so-called short offense positions, where we have our chest on our opponent's back, and from there the scores come so much easier than they do from standing neutral positions. The idea that we're trying to investigate is similar to the idea of position before submission. Only now, yeah. it's standing situation, position before takedown. If we can get to these two positions, takedowns become significantly easier than they do from neutral positions. So we have to show in this video how to get to these positions. No one's yeah. gonna start there. So we start off with ideas of working to get behind our training partner's elbows. So for example, we'll work with drags to get to our training partner's far hip and slip our way into good attacks from any given underhook situation, and here we can throw our training partner's arm up and end up behind our training partner in good attacking position. From any given two-on-one, we'll work with the training partner in like so, we can come up behind our training partner's arm and transition into the back. And from here, the takedowns come so much easier. It's so much easier against, uh, uh, from a situation like so, just to work a training partner down to the floor. And from here, we look at all kinds of ways to trip people down, get into good scoring positions down on the mat. Once we've established the idea that there, is, there are certain positions from which the takedowns are significantly easier, then we look at what I believe is the most interesting subject matter of the video. And this is something I'm, I'm very excited to teach to you all. This is the idea of what actually are the scoring criteria of takedowns in Jiu-Jitsu. And when you look at them, they are significantly different from other grappling sports. Even someone who was already 
very well versed in wrestling and was highly skilled in conventional wrestling skills would find the scoring criteria in Jiu Jitsu quite a struggle when they first began. Mm -hmm. um, you can get situations which would look like a clean takedown in the sport of wrestling, which would score zero mm -hmm. in the sport of Jiu Jitsu. Yeah. So, for example, if Placido is standing in front of me, um, if I shoot for a takedown on Placido and he goes into a good sprawl and successfully goes behind me off the sprawl, in wrestling this would be a takedown. Yep. In Jiu Jitsu this would not be a takedown. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, we also look at the idea that um, uh, from a situation where an opponent successfully gets around behind us, once we get to a position like so, if I lock up, buddy. If I just take even a knee off the ground, my opponent does not score in these kinds of situations. Okay, as long as I have no knees on the ground, he doesn't go into a score. Okay, the real scoring threat doesn't come so much from the takedown as the possible back take from positions like so. And from here, it becomes much more a question of defending not so much the takedown as the back take. And we look at the idea that the scoring of takedowns in Jiu-Jitsu is quite different from most grappling arts. The idea is that once we get to a scoring position and knock someone down, we have to get to a situation where you keep one hip and one shoulder on the floor for three seconds in order to get a successful score. If Placido props up on an elbow, there's no score here because there's no shoulder on the mat. I need a shoulder and a hip down on the floor. Right. If, he, yeah, yep. if he turns to his knees, I have to keep at least one of his knees on the ground for three seconds while I'm behind his elbows in order to get a takedown score. If Placido just comes up to four point, there's no score from here. Okay, he successfully avoided the score. Realistically, the best way for me to score now is to get two hooks in on my opponent and get the rear mounted position. Okay, so we look in detail at the idea of how do people actually score takedowns in the sport of Jiu Jitsu? Because it's not actually obvious at all. The scoring criteria in Jiu-Jitsu for a takedown is so strict and so difficult to apply. I mean, think about it, guys. In a combat sport, three seconds is an eternity. It's a very long period of time. An awful lot can happen in three seconds. You can take someone down for what would be a perfect takedown in Judo or wrestling. They just turn to their stomach and get yep. back up. They've got three seconds to turn to their stomach. That's an awfully long time. You have to hold one knee down on the mat for three seconds. That's damn near impossible on a trained athlete. And so what we find in practice is that you have to create a dilemma between the threat of the takedown, which your opponent can usually, if he's well-trained, easily avoid by turning to all fours and turn the actual scoring mechanism into taking his back and getting two hooks and exploring the rear mount. And so what we find in practice in Jiu-Jitsu, the overwhelming majority of cases, the takedown creates an initial threat, which creates back exposure, and the actual mode of scoring is getting the rear mounted position. And so jiu-jitsu athletes have to train themselves not just for the takedown. The takedown is just the beginning of the story. The end of the story is almost always getting the rear mount of position. Takedowns in jiu-jitsu tend to be scored when the opponent accepts the takedown. If they simply don't accept it, both under ADCC and IBJJF rules, it's almost impossible to score on someone who's well-trained and well-conditioned and springs back up to their feet. And so we have to condition the athletes to, to look for the rear mount as the main scoring opportunity. And insofar as this is true, jiu-jitsu scoring changes radically from wrestling scoring. Um, so for example, if we have an athlete in front of us and we do a good job of turning this guy into a situation where we get him and put him down to his knees. From here, the story is just beginning here, okay? You can clearly see Placido's back is not on the ground. As he starts building up to his base, we have to be able to create situations where we can create the threat of scoring off the back. So as he goes to get up, we have to consistently break this guy, control body, break this guy down to the mat using any one of the methods that we explore in this video and consistently breaking him down. The score from here is almost always going to come from attaining the rear mount. As he goes to get back up, we'll create situations where we can successfully get hooks in. Now you've scored. You've got the rear mounted position. Okay? And so the act of scoring in Jiu Jitsu is always, not always, but in the vast majority of cases, linked to your ability to create an initial takedown threat that creates a defensive reaction in your opponent 
and you as the jiu-jitsu athlete must be trained to get hooks in as they go to avoid that initial takedown threat. Creating that response of not being satisfied with the takedown, but always looking for the actual scoring criteria of the back when they go into the defensive work is one of the key themes of this video. It's right. not just about putting people down. It's about putting them down and getting the score on the jiu-jitsu conditions. Nine times out of 10 means getting to the rear mount. Now that's good news for you jiu-jitsu guys because the rear mount is not only a very dominant position for scoring, but it's also the best position for submitting people as well. So this is a, this is a habit which I'm very much uh, happy to build into jiu-jitsu athletes because it increases scores, increases uh, submission rate. And those are two very healthy things for the sport. So the big things that we're trying to push in this second video, Bernardo, is yep. the idea that work from here is hard work. It's dangerous work. I go in a position like this, I'm going right into plus those guillotines, I'm going right into his sprawls. It's just a it's a tough, tough place to work. Okay. Now because it's the most common place to work, we had to cover this first in the first video, because it, it is yep. the most common place to work. So we spend most of our time. But that I, I said it before, I'll say it again. Just because it's the most common place doesn't mean it's the most desirable place. Yep, yep. In general, we much prefer, whenever possible, to work from positions like so. Well, now, with your, your body behind your opponent, this is where it's easy to get hooks in and start scoring the rear mounted position. If your opponent goes to stand up from positions like this, this is where it's going to be relatively easy to just sort of knock someone down to the floor and get into your, uh, to the scores that you favor. This is the kind of situation where from here it's an easy thing to knock someone down to the mat and get in and get those rear hooks in, okay? Um, it's, it's much, much better to work from those rear mount positions or from positions where we can go in and get simple scores that take us straight into our training partner's back from short offense. Those are the positions that we're looking for and emphasizing very, very heavily in this video, okay? So the two great themes that we're working with, when we go to score takedowns as much as possible, try to get away from just working neutral position. I know that statistically, you're gonna spend most of your time working from neutral positions, simply because that's where the match starts, and it's hard to always get dominant positions on, on, on opponents, but the more we can spend time in these two positions here, and here, the more success we're going to have. And we've got to get away from just thinking about Jiu-Jitsu as a sport of, oh, in standing position, just look for the takedown. Because realistically, the takedown is just the beginning of the story. Yep. The finish of the story is almost always the rear mounted position. So this second video is about how to get to dominant rear mounted positions out of takedown scrambles. This is the, the science of scrimmaging, where both offensively and defensively, I have to teach athletes to scrimmage their way to the rear mounted position. Understanding that the takedown itself is never enough. Against a trained athlete, they're simply not gonna accept both a hip and a shoulder being put down on the ground. As I get knocked down to the ground by any given takedown, it's a relatively simple thing to keep the back off the ground. It's a relatively simple thing, even as it comes around behind me, to come up into a situation where my knees come up off the floor. Yeah, it's hard to get that that uh, that scoring criteria satisfied, and that's why the rear mount, the transition to the rear mount, becomes so important for Jiu Jitsu athletes to develop as a reflex. Again, it's not enough to score the takedown. The takedown just opens the book, and what closes the book is the rear mounted position. So this video is all about that continuity between the takedown and the score. Now. I know people don't like to hear, you know, so Dan, you're all about submission holes. You now you're talking about scoring points. Well, the beauty of the rear mounted position is one of the very few positions where you get the maximum score and the most high yeah. percentage finishing position. So this is one example where scoring and submission are very closely linked. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I don't see this as a, as, a, as a problem for those who favor submission holes. This goes very well in line with the, the submission before everything philosophy. Um, and insofar as this is true, I think this is a very, very interesting project because it cuts to the quick as to what is the distinction between wrestling and jiu-jitsu. When people see no-gi takedowns, they look at it and they go like, dude, it's just bad wrestling. It's just guys that aren't very good at wrestling trying to do double legs and single legs and banging each other on the head. And yeah, I, I get it. There, there's some, there, if you dig around, there's plenty of examples of that going on. But the long-term project for jiu-jitsu should be to build 
an autonomous approach to the standing position, which enables athletes to stay true to the scoring structure of Jiu Jitsu and the emphasis of submission above everything. Yep. And nothing does that better than the idea of incorporating the idea of position before submission, but applying it to takedowns. So now it becomes position before takedowns and then getting to the number one scoring and the number one submission position in the sport, which is the rear mounted position. And building that reflex where people tie together the takedown as the opening move and the rear mounted position as the closing move. And that's what's gonna make Jiu-Jitsu players into closers. People who can go in, make a good strong start with the takedown and then finish with the uh, closing the deal with the rear mounted position. The moment you have a generation of athletes doing that, you're gonna see the sport becomes so much more exciting to watch visually. You get the interplay between standing and ground and finishing percentages are gonna go up because they're working from the rear mounted position, the number one finishing position in the sport. Right, well John, and the, so a few questions here. So for example, you take on a student, what do you teach him first, the neutral positions or mm. the dominant that's, that's, positions? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I usually have them start in the dominant positions and I'll explain why. Um, neutral position, picture how things are different for the average jiu-jitsu student over say for example the average wrestling student when you start the sport of wrestling the average age of people starting in the sport of wrestling is considerably younger than it is in the sport of jiu-jitsu yep. okay if you look at the profile of most people starting wrestling they start in youth wrestling yep. most people start in jiu-jitsu start as adults okay yep. so for a 27 year old guy who hasn't done anything particularly athletic to learn a solid double leg from distance as his first move. Yeah, it's going to be hard. It's, going, it's yeah. going to be hard. It's not impossible, but it's going to be hard. Okay, it's going to. Be, it's, not, it's not going to be the easiest move. It's not going to be as easy as learning an armbar from guard. I'll tell you that right now. Um, now compare that with a seven-year-old kid. It's relatively easy for him yeah. to go through the various body movements, the level change, the penetration to get to a double leg. It's a pretty easy project to teach a seven-year-old kid a double leg. Um, so, realistically, uh, it's going to be hard for the average profile jiu-jitsu student at you know mid-20s or early 30s to just go out and learn the most difficult form of takedown a double leg from neutral as his first move yeah. but it's relatively easy to teach him a takedown from say for example a rear body lock yep. okay that's not particularly difficult and anyone can learn that in a fairly short period of time um, same thing from short offense it's a pretty easy thing if you have your chest on your opponent's back to to go into scores from those positions why because you're so much closer to your opponent here uh, if you're standing buddy from here, a neutral position like so, I'm going into all of my opponent's defenses. He has a height advantage over me, his hips are in a strong position, he can meet me with his hips and get his legs back. It's hard work from here to, 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 to work. There's all kinds of submission dangers. He's got Kimura on my right arm, he's got guillotine on his left. It's tough. Now contrast that with short offense. Now, my weight's on top of him. Okay, he's carrying my weight at this point. The distance between me and his legs is so much shorter now. If his head starts coming up, you're so much closer to his legs now, it's going to be easy to knock someone down from here. Yep. Okay, if anyone's in submission danger now, it's him, not me. Yep. Okay, so, so everything's easier from those dominant positions. So that's where I typically start. Right. I start in a dominant position and then work, let them work take down from there. I don't teach the most difficult things first. Got it. When, when people begin their, their standing training here, so I'm not going to lie to you, confidence is a bit of an issue for them. Got it. You know, you, you, you you come in your first day, you learn a double leg, and then you try to do it live, and you get stuffed ten times and violently guillotined three out, three out of ten times. Your confidence goes down, and yep. you won't shoot. But if you learn how to control someone, say for example from short offense position, double legs are pretty easy from there, yep. and it's hard for your opponent to count you with sprawls and, and guillotines. And so you start hitting the most successfully, and success breeds confidence, and confidence breeds success, and you get a, a much more positive cycle. So I typically emphasize more getting position first in the standing position, and then I work that. And then as their skill level and confidence rises, then we start going from neutral position. Okay. Right. So that's typically the way I coach. Um, you'll generally find that getting to a dominant position, the moves that get you to a dominant position, are relatively easy to, 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 to use. Okay, so for example, a simple arm drag. When you hit an arm drag and get to a position behind your training partner, from here, it's a relatively low risk move. Yep. Okay, there's not a lot that can go wrong with this. A, a, a simple throw by. If we have a throw by here and I put my training buttons out behind me, there's not a lot that can go wrong with this. Yep. Okay? When I go into a double leg, if it doesn't work, 
things go badly wrong, he gets those legs back, it's a, it's a real problem. Now I'm carrying all of his weight. His weight's on top of me. When things go wrong with an arm drag or a throw by him, nothing really bad happens. You're still on your feet. You're not carrying your opponent's body weight. The worst things that happen in the standing position when you carry your opponent's body weight. He's standing over me, and those legs go back, and you're carrying weight, you get extended yeah, up. No, no, this no, this no, is just no, a nightmare, okay? No. Anytime you get extended and you're carrying your opponent's body weight, that's when standing position just becomes miserable, okay? Yeah. But if, a, if an arm drag fails, if we're in here, go get your body sucks. If we're in here and an arm drag fails and he pulls out and circles away, nothing bad happens. Yep. Okay, you're, you're still in position. It's just a work and wrestle. Yep. But if I, if, if I come in here and it all goes to hell and he starts turning the corner on me and spinning around, man, you, you get severely uh, punished. So, um, so what, in this video, what we emphasize is the, the idea of very low risk moves that get you to good positions. Right. Yeah, I think that's what everybody wants yeah. to learn. Right? And then once you get the good positions, the takedowns are a lot easier. And, yeah. and if they do go wrong, they don't go badly wrong. As yeah. opposed to getting hit with your opponent's body weight on top of you. Oh, John, a few more questions. So, yeah. for example, so which advice you would give to someone who wants to learn this type of wrestling? Because it's so easy to tell them, oh, go do, go to a wrestling class, yeah. but that's not what they would learn. And for example, I have seen Gordon training with like Division One Olympic level wrestlers, and if it's wrestling rules. They get you'd crushed. probably get his ass kicked. But if it's ADCC rules, the game different. changes completely. Yeah. So yeah. which advice would you give to that person to become that, like yeah. what Gordon is, for example? That, that's, right? that's, that's a great question. Um, here, here's what I do. This is my philosophy. And it, it would add one more thing. So GSP is another example. Mm -hmm. Like if he does wrestling against a Division One wrestling on wrestling rules, he might end up losing. But on NBA, with punches and kicks involved, the way you taught yeah. him, he there, takes everybody there, down. There, there's actually three fascinating questions. I'll answer all three. Okay, um, your first question was, um, what do you do with uh, uh, preparing someone for? Yeah, uh, you know, for the did, did, did you, do you send someone to a wrestling club to get them ready yeah. for ADCC yeah. rules? My answer to that is no, I don't. Uh, I know I've been accused of arrogance in the past, where people say, oh. Um, Dan Hurd teaches his guys takedowns. He never wrestled. Like, wh what is he doing? Okay. Um, I sincerely believe that when you change the rule set, the entire game changes from from ground up. Okay. Yep. Um, I believe that jujitsu has a huge amount to learn from the sport of wrestling, and no one enjoys watching good wrestling more than me. No one enjoys learning from good wrestlers more than me. But I also understand that the minute you start playing with the rules, you got a different sport on your hands. I agree. Okay. Um, the biggest mistake that I saw when I was coming up through the ranks is people would say, hey, I've got a competition coming up. I need to learn some takedowns. They would go to the local wrestling club for three weeks before, learn a few basic ideas, wrestle with some wrestlers in the standing position, and then go to compete. Then as soon as the competition was over, they would never go back to the oh, wrestling oh. club, go back to I've the wrestling And I've seen this so many times. And you've got to ask yourself a bunch of questions. First, do you really think you're going to just pick up takedowns in three weeks yeah, before? Higher, do you higher. really think that's going to work? Or, yeah, even it's one or two months. Like, 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 what are you going to learn in three weeks? Okay, yeah. uh, uh, to take your point, extend it, three months. Do you, let's compare this in jiu-jitsu. Let's say you're a wrestler and you're about to fight a jiu-jitsu guy in a jiu-jitsu match. Do you really think you could just do jiu-jitsu for three weeks and learn how to defend a triangle? Yeah. Hold or a, a cut of, time. of course not. Yeah. Life doesn't work that way. You don't just learn a skill in, in weeks or months. You learn them in years. And so you can't have this approach of just saying, hey, I'm going to throw in a little bit of wrestling training to see what happens. Your training has to be day in, day out for years at a time. In addition, the rule set of Jiu-Jitsu is completely different. So we will often have elite level wrestlers come and work with our, with our athletes and they will score many takedowns, but they won't score points under jiu-jitsu rules because yeah. they don't understand the yeah. scoring criteria. Yeah. Completely. And so they'll be looking at and say, hey, I took that guy down five times. And I have to explain to them, well, actually you didn't score even a single point. Yeah. You, you did yeah. put him yeah. on his butt four times, that's true, yeah. but you didn't score. And in fact, your opponent scored on you because he hit one go behind and got his hooks in yeah. Yeah. and he actually scored, so you lost. 
and they're looking in disbelief, right? But dude, I, I, I put that guy in his ass three times and you just have to explain the rules to him and then they're like, wow, that's a really weird rule. And then yeah, and it's, you know, really it's, it's, it's a different game. Yeah. It's, um, oh, I it. So I train my athletes for the game they play. I got it. Okay, you go to learn wrestling, you learn wrestling. And it, it's, it's great, you'll learn good mechanical yeah. details, you'll learn all the, the, the mental fortitude that comes with hard wrestling training. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing. I'm not saying don't learn wrestling. But what I am saying is you have to take full time the study of standing position under your rule set because it's very different. And it's not just about having good mechanics on a, on a takedown or a, it's about knowing how to score under your rule set. And the scoring criteria being Jiu Jitsu is heavily influenced by submissions. Submission beats everything. You can be down 100 points to zero and if you submit the guy, you still win. Yep. And the, the dominance of the rear mount is the number one scoring method. So your whole thing in Jiu-Jitsu is to prevent the other guy getting the rear mount to, to, to work away from that. We call this scrimmaging, where you, you scrimmage for points. And the number one point, point method is getting two hooks in and scoring the rear yeah. mount. So you will see after a takedown occurs, the two athletes scrimmaging for position on the ground, and sometimes standing back up, sometimes going back down to the ground, in this constant scrimmaging away from the rear mount for the defensive athlete and towards the rear mount for the offensive athlete. It's a fascinating part of the sport. And it's this very, very interesting merge of the skills of wrestling and Jiu-Jitsu together. You see this at the elite levels in both IBJJF and ADCC yep. competition. Um, it's a fascinating developing part of the game. And the only way, like anything, to get good at is to train it full time, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Yep. You're not gonna do it by going to a wrestling club for two weeks. Yeah. On those rules. Under yeah. those rules, yeah. and then try it on the day to adapt. And life doesn't work yeah. that way. As I said, picture the reverse. Imagine a wrestler going to a jiu-jitsu school and saying, yeah. let me just work triangles for three weeks so I don't get triangled by yeah. my opponent. It's not gonna, that, that's, yeah. that's, that doesn't work that way. Um, now you also answer, asked a, a, a similar question, is what about George St. Pierre? Um, he never wrestled and yet he that's did crazy incredibly like, well. To me, that's the craziest example. A couple ever. of things you gotta know. First off, um, George would actually do extremely well in pure wrestling against okay. even good wrestlers. There's, there's empirical evidence of this. He fought Otto Olsen, who was, I believe, a two-time uh, champion in college. He was at least All-American. He's very, very yeah. good. And um, uh, George fought him in ADCC as, a, I think, a blue or purple belt. Now, Otto Olsen had gotten a silver medal in ADCC, mostly through wrestling. I think he lost to Marcelo Garcia in the finals of 2003, if I remember correctly. But he was an elite-level wrestler. And George took him down, I think, three times. That's in crazy. ADCC competition and was not taken down. And once. just doing this type of training? And that was just grappling. Okay. That there's no striking. So, yeah. so don't think George is like yeah. some guy who, if there was just wrestling, he'd be, he, he went with a okay. very good wrestler and took him down three times. But not doing yeah. like wrestling classes, right? Doing this type of like grappling, takedown yeah, classes. But, right? but even in pure wrestling, he's a handful okay. for a good wrestler. Like, like you know, he's. He's trained with you know, like Olympic gold medalists and done oh, yeah. very well and, and wrestling rule set. So with wrestling shoes on, yeah. like oh, he, he's, he's not, impressive. people have this mistaken idea. They, oh, he's, he's only good in MMA wrestling. No, he's also good in just pure wrestling. wrestling. Yeah. The only proviso I put on that is that George never trains for what the wrestlers call parterre, which is wrestling groundwork, yeah. because that's not relevant to his sport. So if he went into elite level wrestling, he would be beaten. He would be highly competitive on the feet with them but he would be beaten easily in the part here. Things like gut yeah. wrenches yeah. and leg laces, he doesn't really train those because they're not relevant. They're, so he'd be yeah. beaten in, in, with those moves yeah. quite easily. Um, but in standing takedowns, he'd be a handful, even for a very good wrestler. It'd be a tough yeah. match, it'd be a competitive match. Would he win? No, but he would, it would be a competitive match. Um, then you ask the other question is, well, what about an MMA? Well, that goes back to what we said before. Takedowns in MMA are a completely different ball game from takedowns in wrestling. The, they have superficial similarities. What you would say is that the, the completion of takedowns in MMA is similar to wrestling, but the entries to the takedowns are 100% different. The stance is different, the distances are different, the setups are completely different. It's a completely different ball game. Um, you learn wrestling in MMA to finish the takedowns, but you learn shoot boxing to enter the takedowns. So George is the best of all time at entering into the takedowns. His entries were so crisp and so clean that the finishing was almost like a formality. Yeah. Wrestling was more than enough yeah. to, to, to finish it. 
So those are some fascinating questions you asked. Yeah. Um, we've gotten a little bit off topic. Um, but, no, but uh, no, that was a great conversation. Yeah. Right, Joy, I love the fact that, for example, you were the wrestling coach, you were the striking coach. I know, the other day I was even watching one interview between Joe Rogan and I don't remember who, but they were talking about that, how you were the, I think it was Joe, I think it was Joe Rogan and Gordon, and they, they were talking about how you were the striking coach, like uh, you, you have all this knowledge, you don't teach Muay Thai to Muay Thai fighters, but you teach Muay Thai to MMA fighters, yeah. and it's a completely different game as yeah. you were just explaining here. So for me, it's, it's, it's about integration of skills. Yeah. And um, uh, whenever you have, uh, uh, a combat sport which involves integrated martial arts and let's be honest ADCC is the integration yep. of jiu-jitsu and wrestling it's what, yep. it's what the rule set is designed to, to do yep. it's not just a jiu-jitsu tournament yep. and it's yep. not just a wrestling tournament it's, it's an integrated art yep. the winner is not the one who's best at one of the skills yep. the winner is the one who integrates them the everything best. yeah, yeah. No, that means you don't have to be the best wrestler you don't have to be the best pure jiu-jitsu guy yep. you've got to be the one who integrates well. it best George was never the best striker. He was never the best takedown guy. But he could, but he could integrate them yeah. together. Yeah. And that's what makes no, it. And I think that's the reason that everybody buys your videos because you're always teaching how to integrate stuff. And yeah. Uh, yeah. But um, uh, I'm looking forward to the second video, Bernardo, because um, uh, you know, all our lives in Jiu Jitsu, we were taught about the idea of position before submission. And here we are looking at position before takedown now. And yeah. uh, we investigate two major positions. And then we look at how ultimately the whole scoring criteria of our sport is again built around position. And in this case, it's using the uh, the, the rear mount as the, the the main method of scoring in jiu-jitsu and looking at the integration of takedown to rear mount. And I'm very very confident that once uh, uh, emerging athletes in jiu-jitsu get this notion, you're going to see positional uh, sorry submission rates in the sport start to increase the more athletes fight their way from the takedown to the rear mounted position you're going to see exciting matches and you're going to see matches that finish by submission yeah no joe i really love it how you broke down two different courses one all about neutral positions the other one all about position dominance and guys so this is the second part of standing to ground series from john all about position dominance standing and the uh, as you guys can see like this is just like the the video that you explain and look how long it was and uh, that's how john does his stuff it's always like the most complete instructional you can ever imagine and it's going to be at bgjfanatics.com maybe by the time you are watching it's already there so make sure to check that out and thanks so much john no problem. Thank, thank you, you again thank you was placid. please help me out to grow my youtube channel just click subscribe and to watch more videos just click under see more videos i hope you enjoyed BJJFanatics.com. Use the promo code YouTubeFaria to get 10% off any instructional video. Improve your jujitsu faster.